These are the 400 genes, and this is real data from my laboratory, from human cells, 400 genes that respond most to protandum being added to the culture medium. And the height of, there are 400 little bars here, and you can't see them individually, but the height of each one tells you how frequently that gene is being expressed, how often that blueprint is being called out of the nucleus of that cell and functionally translated into the product uh, for which that blueprint uh, encodes. This is the way those 400 genes are expressed when uh, oxidative stress is low. So we could call this a properly tuned genome. Because you can't see the individual genes when they're that many, I've taken a little area in the center part of this randomly in that red box, which is about 63 genes. And we're going to look at that a little more closely. They're now spread out. You can see them individually. The name of each gene is on the bottom of the axis, and they don't mean much to you, and some of them don't mean much to me. Some of them... <laughs> Some of them, in fact, are of unknown function. We know the gene is there. We know its sequence. We don't fully understand what that gene does. But in other cases, we know exactly what it does, what disease it may be involved in. So this is, six, I think, 63 genes chosen uh, just to be in the middle of that range. And this is how they're expressed when oxidative stress is low, uh, specifically when protandum is in the medium. If we grow, and this is in a human cell line. If we grow these same cells without protandum under conditions that have oxidative stress, what do you think it looks like? It looks like that, okay? So that's equivalent to grandma's piano after 50 years in the attic. And the difference between that and this is protandum, all right? It's a dramatic <laughs> illustration. <laughs> and let, let me point out to you, too, how, how dramatically things have changed. Protandum was developed primarily to affect three gene products, superoxide dismutase, or SOD, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase. And the literature, as of five years ago, led us to believe that this could happen, this would happen with protandum. And indeed, it did affect those three genes. What we've learned in the last five years is that it affects not only those 63 genes, but these 400 genes, all right? So three of those are SOD, catalase, and glutathione, have, or glutathione peroxidase. Have we realized that protandum does a lot more than that? You bet. We went from three genes to four or 500 genes that we're now talking about. Each of, each of those genes has its own story. And I, I, your eyes would quickly glaze over if I went through the first 200 of those. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is give you an example on each end of the spectrum in the few minutes remaining. One of the genes that caught my eye when I looked at this entire 400 genes was at one end of the spectrum, that is, of all the genes that are downregulated, which one is downregulated the most? And this gene called fatty acid binding protein 4, meant nothing to me at the time, was strongly downregulated by protandum. And I'll show you the data in, in a moment. And so what do I do when I see something like that? Well, I go to pubmed.gov that I showed you earlier. I type in fatty acid binding protein 4, or FABP4, the name of that gene. And my question is, what is this involved in? Is it good to be high? Is it good to be low? What do we know collectively about fatty acid binding protein 4? And this paper appeared um, just in the last month. And it says that this one and a related gene, fatty acid binding protein 5, another gene, are related to the metabolic syndrome. All right, that's epidemic in this country. That's when people get older, they get obese. It involves inflammation. It involves atherosclerosis. It involves type 2 diabetes. It involves calcification of arteries. 
a lot of nasty things are related to these two gene products. The conclusions from this paper, I just kind of summarized, FABP4 and to a lesser extent FABP5 contribute to insulin resistance, which is part of type 2 diabetes, to atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, cardiovascular disease. Reduction of FABP4 provides a striking resistance to the development of insulin resistance and multiple features of the metabolic syndrome. All right, that's powerful. In this paper, they could lower FABP4 by genetic manipulations, things that we can't do to ourselves, but we can do to animals in a lab, provided resistance uh, to metabolic syndrome. And uh, at the bottom there, FABP4 associated with metabolic syndrome, inflammation, coronary calcification in humans. What does protandum do to it? On the left, you see the effect of protandum on human cells in culture. The left bar is the control without protandum. At two concentrations of protandum increasing, you see an 85% reduction of this FABP4 gene product. The related one, FABP5, showed a 66% reduction in response to protandum. All right, the higher this gene is, the more likely you are to get metabolic syndrome, uh, calcified arteries, and the related bad things that happen. At the other end of the spectrum, another gene, and again, when I saw this one, this is one of the most potently upregulated genes by protandum. Uh, the gene is named AKR1B10. That didn't mean anything to me, even though I'm a biochemist. It's a human aldo-keto reductase, but I, I put it in PubMed to see what, what is this gene doing. Protandum strongly cranks it up. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? These two papers were published within the last year. Again, rapidly moving scenario. And look at this title, this gene, uh, AKR1B10, promotes cell survival, sounds good, by regulating lipid synthesis and eliminating carbonyls. Well, you may not know what carbonyls are, but carbonyls are related to T-bars, which you have heard before, lipid peroxidation products. The conclusions of these two papers is that this uh, uh, gene responds to free radical damage which results in formation of toxic lipid peroxidation products, so that broadly is T-bars. More specifically, it's talking about one of those products, 4-hydroxynonanol, 4-HNE, which may ultimately lead to cell death. These aldehydes damage the DNA. They can cause mutations. And this gene, efficient, the gene product, efficiently catalyzes the reduction of 4-HNE protecting cells from toxic effects. What does protandum do to this gene? The one on the left is the control. And here you see two concentrations, a very low and a higher concentration of protandum, a 3,200%, 32-fold increase in the production of, the, of this gene product. And this is a good one. The more of this you have, the more protected you are. Right? And each of those 400 genes can be analyzed in this way. And I have to tell you, I haven't made my way through all 400 of them, but I spend hours and hours ferreting out what those genes are, what they do, and the overall predominant theme is exactly what you've seen here. The genes that help our cells survive are upregulated. The genes that are doing the damage um, causing the problems are, uh, are being decreased. Um, so I think that's pretty much the end of what I have to say. I want to tell you <laughs> a lot of these guys have contributed to what I've told you today. 